Good morning. Welcome back to the second hour of our study today. This is uh, CMS Lesson 10, Conscience, Morality, and Spirituality. And today we're revisiting the topic of conscience and have looked in the first hour at uh, Oswald Chambers' presentation on conscience from his Biblical Theology book. And we've looked at uh, Vincent's Word Studies uh, definition of conscience, and I believe we're continuing and concluding that uh, at the beginning of this hour, and then we'll look at some others, and then we'll actually get into a little bit of uh, where we're headed, uh, where you get to see some purpose in this study, so that we can <laughs> uh, get through and uh, get to to and cut <laughs> so we can get through and uh, cover the uh, the subject and introduce where we're going with it in the in the future so let's begin with a moment of silent prayer the opportunity to utilize first john 1 9 as we go into our uh, uh, time of prayer before we begin our study please pray with me if necessary utilize first john 1 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, thereby putting us into fellowship with the Father so that we might be uh, open to the teaching of the Holy Spirit uh, in our spirits. Father, as we study this hour, we once again ask for the Spirit's mentorship in our studies, showing us what is true and false according to your standard, your conscience, that uh, you provide for us as part of our reservoir of righteousness uh, in us so that we might understand the truth of the word and how the things around us align themselves with or against your truth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Conscience is a faculty. The mind may possess reason and distinguish between the true and the false, and yet be incapable of distinguishing between virtue and vice. We're picking up here, I believe we're, well, we're still in Vincent. We are entitled, therefore, to hold that the drawing of moral distinctions is not comprehended in the simple exercise of the reason. Okay, let's go through those first two paragraphs again. The mind may possess reason and distinguish between the true and the false, and yet be incapable of distinguishing between virtue and vice. We, excuse me, are entitled, therefore, to hold that the drawing of moral distinctions is not comprehended in the simple exercise of the reason. The conscience, in short, is a different faculty of the mind from the mere understanding. Okay. We can take in knowledge and that that capacity to take in information does not give us that standard of right and wrong that conscience is a separate faculty okay? it's a separate part of our makeup and it is not mere understanding but then we'll make judgment on what we have understood. And you've, you've experienced this in that you have heard something or been asked a question, and is that right or is that wrong? And you say, hmm, I'll have to think about it. I'll have to think about it. You got the information and your conscience did not have any judgment to pass on the right or wrong of that. Why? She didn't have background in order to be able to know if that's right or wrong. You did not have biblical doctrine related to that issue. You didn't have more background, social mores. You didn't have custom background for that issue. There was nothing in your background, human or spiritual, to be able to, to pass judgment on the virtue or vice of that 
or the right or wrongness of that. Okay? So the conscience, in short, is a different faculty of the mind from mere understanding. We must hold it to be simple and unresolvable till we fall in with a successful decomposition of it into its elements, and that's where we're headed. In the absence of any such decomposition, we hold that we, there are no simpler elements in the human mind which will yield us the ideas of the morally good and evil, of moral obligation and guilt, of merit and demerit. Compound and decompound all other ideas as you please. Associate them together as you may. They will never give us the ideas referred to, so peculiar and full of meaning, without a faculty implanted in the mind for this very purpose, and that faculty is conscience. Conscience is a sentiment. That is, it contains and implies conscious emotions which arise on the discernment of an object as good or bad. The judgment formed by conscience awakens sensibility. When the judicial faculty pronounces a thing to be lovable, it awakens love. When it pronounces it to be noble or honorable, it awakens respect and admiration. When it pronounces it to be cruel or vile, it awakens disgust and abhorrence. Now, remember from Jonathan Haidt that he says that it is an emotional reaction, that conscience is a, an emotional reaction, that we make that like looking at art we know that we like it, but we couldn't tell you why, unless we're asked and we have to make something up. Is the confabulation that we talked about in the division of right brain and left brain patients. His viewpoint is that conscience is an emotion, and that there that morality is emotional, that we know it when we see it, but we have no real basis. And remember the story about the brother and sister traveling in France, and, and when you ask people, is it right or wrong, what they did, that they say it's wrong, but they can't come up with a good reason why it's wrong, and then they at last say, well, I don't know why it's wrong, I just know it's wrong. Well, he's saying that that's an automatic process that takes place in us, where Vincent here is saying that, that the Judicial faculty is what arouses those sentiments, those emotions, okay? So conscience is a sentiment. It contains and implies conscious emotions which arise on the discernment of an object as good or bad. That conscience says good, and that awakens emotions related to that good. Honorable, uh, loving, or lovable, or whatever it happens to be, or bad, and that then awakens those emotions of disgust and abhorrence. In Scripture, we are to view conscience, as Bishop Ellicott remarks, not in its abstract nature, but in its practical manifestations. Hence, it may be weak, as seen in 1 Corinthians 8, 7, and 12, unauthoritative and awakening only the feeblest emotion. It may be evil or defiled, Hebrews 10.22 and Titus 1.15, through consciousness of evil practice. It may be seared, 1 Timothy 4.2, branded by its own testimony to evil practice, hardened and insensible to the appeal of good. See, if you keep, if you keep shutting off your conscience as to what is right or wrong in a particular area, Let's say that you're a fine, upstanding Christian working in the finance committee of the church. Beware, finance committee, we're watching you. In the finance committee of the church. And you're uh, stealing money from the church. And at first you steal a little bit of money because your child is sick and you don't have the money for the medicine that the child has to take. So you take that money, and you're going to pay it back. But you need it right now, so I'm just going to take a little of this money out so I can buy this medicine. Once my child is better, then I'll be able to save up some money and put it back into the account. And uh, then something else happens. And you say, well, 
I, I'll pay that back too, and I'll take it. Even though I know it's wrong, I'll take that. And, and, and then slowly and gradually, you cauterize that, that feeling that you get, that moral sentiment that you get that you're doing something wrong until you lose it. And then you suddenly decide, oh, I'm not even going to pay this back. And you come up with a good reason. That preacher is a hypocrite anyway, and they're not spending that money in the right way. They're not giving it to the poor. They're buying uh, trips for the, for the deacons uh, to go on a, on a retreat. And that's a big waste of that money. So you sear that conscience. You change your perspective of what is right and wrong based on your own vile action. Remember it says uh, it may be evil or defiled through consciousness of evil practice. That you, that you do it branded by its own testimony to evil practice. Hardened and insensible to the appeal of good. And so you finally just shut that off. And then you can steal from anything. You can steal from anybody. So you go from stealing from the finance committee at the church to, to, uh, to embezzling money at work. And you get caught and they, you say, well, you know, they were doing bad too. See, you try to make up an excuse for it, that it was okay for you to do that. Well, that's that searing of your conscience, cauterizing it so that it's insensitive to the what you know either from the way you were raised or from the scriptures and the Holy Spirit of what is right and wrong. On the other hand, it may be pure, 2 Timothy 1.3, unveiled and giving honest and clear moral testimony. It may be void of offense, unconscious of evil intent or act, good as here or honorable in Hebrews 13.18. Remember, Paul said, my conscience bearing me witness well, remember in another place he said, I can't rely on my own conscience. It's God that judges me. Well, as functioning, what the context tells us is that in that particular instance when he says, my conscience bearing me witness, that he has confir confirmation from the Holy Spirit that his conscience is accurate, that it is correct, that he is making the right decision not the wrong decision like he did back when he killed Christians. Okay? When his conscience told him to do that too. Huh? The expression and the idea. The expression and the idea in the full Christian sense are foreign to the Old Testament. Where the testimony of the character of moral action and character is borne by external revelation. Rather than by the inward moral consciousness. And that's from Vincent. Now we go to Vine's uh, dictionary and we look at conscience and see a little bit more of the nuance of the word from which uh, conscience comes. Soon a a knowing with uh, is the literal translation of that. A knowing with, sun plus oida, sun means with, oida means to know, to know with. Uh, that is a co-knowledge with oneself, just similar to what we saw earlier. The witness born to one's conduct by conscience, that faculty by which we apprehend the will of God as that which is designed to govern our lives, hence the sense of guiltiness before God. Okay. Now, do you see here that Vine, like Vincent, refers to this in the uh, sense of relationship to God. Like believers or people raised in a believer's home that have, uh, have this concept of God. See, it says, uh, the faculty by which we apprehend the will of God. Well, that's only for believers. That's not the, true for unbelievers. They don't they don't apprehend the will of God with their conscience. Right? Their consciences are formed and uh, colored by the way they are raised, the social mores of their society and the 
the uh, morals taught to them by their parents are how they establish that standard in their conscience. But when we reach God consciousness, do you understand that your conscience changed when you became a believer? If you became a believer as an adult, then you can see that. If you became a believer as a child, you may not have been able to notice that. But uh, what is right and wrong certainly changes uh, when you become a Christian, and it changes as you become more and more attuned to God through his word. Okay? So uh, it's uh, the faculty by which we apprehend the will of God as that which is designed to govern our lives, hence the sense of guiltiness before God, and that process of thought which distinguishes what it considers morally good or bad, commending the good, condemning the bad, and so prompting to do the former and avoid the latter. Sounds, sounds a lot like vine there. That process of thought which distinguishes what it considers morally good or bad. Okay? Not necessarily in relationship to God. Okay? This would be the, the uh, other aspect of the uh, conscience. So Romans 2.15, bearing witness with God's law. That was the verse we started with. That the, that the pagans, that the unbelievers, uh, in their conscience knew what was right or wrong and would be judged by that conscience. Acting in a certain way because conscience requires it, Romans 13, 5. So as not to cause scruples of conscience in another. 1 Corinthians 10, 28 and 29 that we talked about in Chambers last hour. That you do, you give up your right to not hinder the gospel uh, by offending or causing someone else to stumble, I should say, rather than just the offense. Uh, not calling a thing in question unnecessarily as if conscience demanded it, 1 Corinthians 10, 25 and 27, and commending oneself to every man's conscience, 2 Corinthians 4, 2, compared with 5, 11. There may be a conscience not strong enough to distinguish clearly between the lawful and the unlawful, 1 Corinthians 8, 7, 10 and 12, uh, the phrase conscience towards God in 1 Peter 2.19 signifies a conscience or perhaps here a consciousness so controlled by the apprehension of God's presence that the person realizes that griefs are to be borne in accordance with his will. Hebrews 9.9 9 teaches that sacrifices under the law could not so perfect a person that he could regard himself as free from guilt. Now there is no sacrifice that can purge our conscience, conscience from guilt. Okay. Jesus Christ, however, his sacrifice was able to do that. So we don't have to have guilt. And we'll see that coming up as we get to the end of our study. For various descriptions of conscience also see uh, the following verses. So I recommend to you that you look up these verses that we've seen here in the last couple of slides. Slides 55, 56. <coughs> that you look them up and see how it fits in so you'll have a better understanding of conscience. As an aside here, also from, uh, from Vines, he, he talks about the word logismos, uh, a reasoning, a thought. It's akin to the word logizomai or logizomai, to count or reckon. It's translated thoughts in Romans 2.15, suggestive of evil intent, not of mere reasonings. And it's uh, translated imaginations in 2 Corinthians 10.5. The word suggests the contemplation of actions as a result of the verdict of conscience. So you get that conscience and then you decide what you're going to do with it. Okay? Remember in, in Romans uh, 2.15, their thoughts either accusing or excusing themselves. So their logismos, either accusing or excusing themselves. What you do based on that that to judgment of the conscience. And we'll see that later in our studies. So I thought I'd go ahead and throw it in here now. Now Robertson, A.T. Robertson's word studies in the Greek New Testament. Uh, the word sunidesis means co-knowledge by the side of the original consciousness of the act. The second knowledge is personified as confronting the first. Okay? This is what you learn. This is the confrontation of that. Is it right or wrong? The Stoics use the word a great deal, and Paul has it 20 times. It's not in the Old Testament, but first uh, in this sense in, in the book of Wisdom, 1710. 
All men have this faculty of passing judgment on their actions, or their thoughts for that matter. It can be overscrupulous, 1 Corinthians 10.25, or seared by abuse, excuse me, 1 Timothy 4.12. It acts according to the light it has. Remember, we started off at last hour when we looked at it that it will always attach to the highest the person knows. Whatever the highest is, that's how you'll set that standard. Whatever the highest is. If it's the Bible, if it's the, if it's the Quran, if it's the Book of Mormon, if it's the uh, teachings of Lao Tzu uh, in Taoism, if it's the teachings of Buddha, whatever it happens to be, that will become your highest, the highest you know, and that's how you will establish the baseline of what uh, the standard will be, right or wrong, good or bad, vile or pleasurable. It's all going to be determined by whatever you have chosen to be your, your standard, your highest standard. Romans 2.15, their thoughts one with another accusing or also excusing them. The genitive absolute again showing the alternative action of the conscience. Now accusing, now excusing. Paul does not say that a heathen's conscience always commends everything that he thinks, says, or does. In order for one to be set right with God by his own life, he must always act in accord with his conscience and never have its disapproval. That, of course, is impossible, else Christ died for naught. Jesus alone lived a sinless life. For one to be saved without Christ, he must also live a sinless life. And the conscience is uh, what God has given to us all to know that no matter what our standard is, we can't meet it. Doesn't meet it if you have a bad set of standards. Let's say that you were raised in a witchcraft home, uh, you still can see that you cannot meet all those standards. Okay? You can still see that. So everyone knows that they fail to meet the standards, even their own standards, let alone those of God. Tori, uh, uh, this is uh, from uh, Tori's book, uh, and it has all of these references, and these I've put in here. We'll probably look at several of them as we go on but I put them in here so you could have them for your homework assignment. Uh, the conscience witnesses in man, the uh, verses there in Proverbs and Romans. It accuses of sin, and you have several references there. We should have the approval of our conscience, and we see those references. The blood of, of Christ alone can purify the conscience, as we just talked about a couple of slides back, Hebrews 9, 14, 10, 2 through 10, and, and verse 22. Uh, keep the faith in purity of conscience. Uh, of saints, it's pure and good. Uh, it uh, Submit to authority for conscience sake. Suffer patiently for conscience sake. Testimony of the conscience is a source of joy. Uh, the conscience of others not to be offended. And ministers should commend themselves to that of other people. Of the wicked, the conscience is seared. Of the wicked, it is defiled. Without spiritual illumination, it is a false guide. Okay? So there's a good uh, summary of conscience that you can look up those verses and see how all of that fits. And like I said, we'll, we'll cover some of this, uh, hit some of those verses when we look at examples of conscience and how conscience fits in uh, with spirituality. Here we go to the, uh, really the meat of our study so far, uh, other than understanding where Height is, Jonathan Height is coming from and understanding his perspective. This is where we first, uh, you, you are first introduced to a scriptural viewpoint on the importance of conscience and how it fits in in the spiritual life. Remember, our Subject is conscience, morality, and spirituality, and how they fit together where they belong in the believer's life. So here we see in Stanford, in, uh, from Miles Stanford, who's one of my favorites, and one I highly recommend you can read for uh, hours and hours and hours in Stanford's collected works, and uh, you'll almost never go wrong. Chapter 7, Sin and Purged Conscience. Briefly, it can be said that due to the fall of man came into, uh, due to the fall, man came into possession of a moral sense to distinguish right and wrong known as conscience. Well, notice what he says here. 
due to the fall of man, due to the fall, man came into possession of a moral sense. You see, that tree is called what? The knowledge of good and evil. And we emphasize that it created a sinful nature in us that allows us to perform human good and human evil. But it also contains conscience, according here to what Stanford says, that conscience is part of that sinful nature, that it's not part of our soul. So that's another approach, one that I hinted at earlier, that, that perhaps the conscience is part of our fallen nature, that it's not part of our soul and corrupted by the sinful nature, but that it is corrupt because it's part of the sinful nature. So we'll look at that later too as we go along. We can't solve every issue immediately as we go through them. Man's sinful condition, however, and this is another one of those uh, places where you underline and put stars. Man's sinful condition, however, renders conscience an unreliable guide. Nevertheless, the Holy Spirit works upon the conscience in bringing conviction of sin. Okay? When the Holy Spirit speaks to the unbeliever about their need for Christ, he speaks through their conscience. That's where they need to hear because it's the conscience that decides what's right what's wrong okay so they have to get that in their conscience so that's where the holy spirit works the natural man due to such factors as heredity social and religious training and environment the conscience of the unbeliever has an erratic range all the way from good to very bad but either way its ground of reference is wrong since it is centered in the self-life. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 tells us, when they measure themselves with themselves and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding and behave unwisely. You see, that comparison is based on what? I'm right, you're wrong. I compare myself with others and I decide right and wrong if I'm right and they're wrong. So it's, it's behaving unwisely and it's without understanding, without, without knowledge, proper knowledge, scriptural knowledge. So they measure themselves, measure themselves by their conscience. It's wrong because it's based in what? It's all about self because it's the only reference you have when you don't have God as a reference point. At best, the unsaved are under legal bondage. At best, the unsaved are under legal bondage. They are a law to themselves. They show that the essential requirements of the law are written in their hearts and are operating there, with which their conscience, their sense of right and wrong, also bears witness. So the unbeliever has a conscience and the essential elements of the law are in there. That's part of the knowledge of good and evil are the essential elements of the law. So they know what is right and wrong. Then that can become perverted and twisted as, as their environment and their, their social, religious, traditional uh, upbringing changes it. Okay? Even when the unbeliever's conscience is clear, this state is often attained by a combination of rationalization and good works resulting in self-righteousness, okay? So when I want to know how good I am, I use a combination of rationalization and good works and that's what the Bible calls self-righteousness. Is all self-righteousness truly righteous? No, it's not. But by rationalization, I convince myself that it is. Okay? That I am good enough to stand before God. Okay? And I've made a note here. Uh, well, let's read the next bullet first. Hence, his so-called good conscience is the very element that tends to keep him from seeing his need for God's righteousness and life. And this is the greatest stumbling block to reaching the moral person. 
right here. It's the greatest stumbling block because his so-called good conscience is the very element that tends to keep him from seeing his need. Okay? Rationalization and good works. I'm better than so-and-so. I do these good things and I know Christians that don't. Why should I be a Christian? I'm better than they are. Okay. Rationalization and good works come together to form self-righteousness. Okay. Good definition of self-righteousness. On the other hand, when his conscience is bad, he flees from God with a sense of despair because of personal unworthiness. This is the person who knows that they are a scumbag. Okay. This is the prostitutes and the sinners that Jesus hung out with in the bars uh, during his time on earth. The people who knew they were sick and needed a doctor. Okay? People who have a bad conscience, people whose conscience is convicting them and telling them how bad they are, are readily accepting of God. Okay? So God will oftentimes take that person that we saw in the previous slide with their self-righteousness, okay, and he will put them into a situation where they recognize that their conscience is bad, okay, that they are personally unworthy. Okay? It is only when the Holy Spirit convicts the mind, heart, and conscience concerning sin, whether of self-righteousness or of unworthiness, that the sinner can see his need of turning to Christ. The carnal man, or I've inserted Christian here, the carnal Christian, as far as his conscience is concerned, the carnal Christian is much the same as the unbeliever. You see it all the time in churches. You see it all the time in Christian organizations. You see it all the time in community life, that the carnal Christian is much the same as the unbeliever. By dint of self-effort to produce some good works for God and the blind rationalization of comparing himself with supposedly weaker Christians or unbelievers, he is able sporadically to maintain some semblance of a good conscience. This very feeling, false as it is, tends to exaggerate his dependence upon himself. 2 Corinthians 10, 17, and 18 refers to this person. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For he, not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Okay? If they want to name something for you in your church, you had better take stock of your life. Okay? He that commendeth himself uh, is not approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Okay? So, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. In the Lord doesn't mean, oh, praise God, I did such and such. Okay, that's not it. That's not it. Okay, that's not glorying in the Lord. Glorying in himself. Oh, yes. Brother Rich here has uh, donated more money than anybody else to our new building fund. Brother Paul has done such and such. Okay, and you see it all the time in carnal Christians that they're, they're functioning in their happiness motivators. The human nature happiness motivators of power and approbation. Okay? They, they want that. You know? We're going to make you the head of the such and such committee. Okay? Because you are so wonderful. Okay? Now, this is the greatest stumbling block to living the spiritual walk. And this also is the goal of our study, to recognize and eliminate this error in our lives. When we are glorying in ourselves, and when we are glorying in the Lord. When we are commending ourselves, and when uh, the Lord is commending us. We don't want to maintain some semblance of a good conscience. We want a conscience that is confirmed by the Father, through the Holy Spirit in us. When the carnal believer's conscience is bad, he seeks to hide from God and even attempts to place the blame for his sinfulness upon others. In fact, very often, upon God. Some of my reading this week, I spent 
with a uh, fella who is uh, who talks about his deconversion, how he became deconverted and left Christianity, and he tells his story, and the man is a genius. He's not only a genius, he's a genius who has dedicated a lot of time in proving that God and the Bible are all fairy tales. He has spent, I couldn't tell you how many hours, and he has a tremendous argument. Tremendous argument. Okay? Don't read him if you don't have a strong faith because he will shake your faith with all of the things that he points out are inconsistent in the Bible unless you know what they mean and why they're there. Okay? But he has spent all that time doing that. And uh, Phil, if Phil is his name, uh, Phil did this because he had a problem. When he was a Christian and a very vital Christian, Phil had this sexual temptation problem that he spent hours on his knees praying God would take away. And God didn't do it. So what did Phil have to do? He had to, he had to come up with an excuse why he should go ahead and follow through with this sexual temptation, this besetting sin that he had, and go ahead with it. And in order to justify that, he had to do what? Prove that the Bible that condemned his sexual proclivity was erroneous. It was a fairy tale. So he set about and spends hours on his blog going through all the things that are wrong about Christianity and God, and that God is Santa Claus. That God is on an equal basis as Santa Claus. So, the, uh, uh, it's amazing uh, how, they how they blame, and he talks about how happy he is now and how miserable he was then. Well, why is he happy now? Because he's having some. Because he's doing what he wants to do. <laughs> and cut. We can sit in the back row next time. Uh, balcony uh, ushers, put her in the balcony next time. Uh, gee, I've lost my train of thought. Because he gave in to his... He yeah, seared his conscience. So that his conscience no longer bothers him uh, anymore. And uh, But he, he still has to continue on. I mean, this is, gone, this is years ago that this happened. And maybe 20 years ago. But he still has to blog about it to keep that conscience down. Okay? And uh, when I was reading, of course, the first thing I want to do is go through and argue all of his points. Well, he's got hundreds of them. And like I said, they're very, very sophisticated arguments. And uh, so I was thinking, okay, do I want to invest the time to go in there and debate him on all of these things? And, uh, and I thought, boy, you know, I just don't have that kind of time to do that. But there are people reading him that surely need to see the truth of the, of the gospel. Uh, should I do that? And I thought, you know, all I have to do is, is break his, his, the basis of everything that he's done by showing what he was and how, what his error was and how that set him off in the wrong direction. And uh, so I will do that. Uh, when the carnal believer's conscience is bad, he seeks to hide from God and even attempts to place the blame for his sinfulness upon others. It's God's fault. I prayed on my knees for hours and hours and hours for God to take this away, and he never did. Therefore, there's no God. Okay? Yep. And instead of reading the word, and he went around for months to pastors, two years. He spent going to pastors to try to get them to convince him to stay with God. That, that God was there. And none of them could. None of them could. So, he gave up. He said, if the pastors don't know, uh, then it's all a fairy tale. All right. 
All right. Yet the Holy Spirit often works through the conscience to turn such a one to the Lord Jesus for cleansing from unrighteousness and spiritual growth. Hebrews 10.22 Let us all come forward and draw near with true, honest and sincere hearts in unqualified assurance and absolute conviction engendered by faith, that is, by that leaning of the entire human personality on God in, uh, in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness, having our hearts sprinkled and purified from a guilty conscience. Okay. So how do you get that? Heart purified? from a guilty conscience. Let us all come forward and draw near with true, sincere and honest hearts in unqualified assurance and absolute conviction engendered by faith, right? having our hearts sprinkled and purified from a guilty, evil conscience. The spiritual man. We studied the carnal man. Now let's look at the spiritual man. The believer who rests in his position rather than his condition who abides in his risen Lord in the presence of the Father, is growing spiritually. He is fully assured that Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, 1 Peter 3.18. By simple faith in the facts, he acknowledges his place in Christ, who is his life, the one who, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Knowing his sins to be purged once for all, his conscience is thereby clear, since the worshipers once purged have no more conscience of sins. The spiritually minded believer is conscious of sin in him, but he is fully assured that there is no sin on him. All of his sin has been laid upon the Lord Jesus. Although his condition is needy, for he is indwelt by the principle of sin, he lives in his position in Christ. His consistent resources for spiritual growth are received from on high. He knows his freedom to come boldly under the throne of grace in order that he may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When the growing believer sins, his conscience and his communion with the Father being thereby disturbed, he freely confesses his sin. He knows that the Lord Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He also has recourse to the truth that when he does sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Hence, a pure conscience and communion are restored and maintained, and he is free to continue his fellowship with the Son and the Father. He has learned that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Condition. The condition-centered Christian has no other recourse but to fight against indwelling sin and thus seek to control self as best he can. Added to this intolerable burden is the frustrating fact that God does not seem to help him in this endeavor. Added to this intolerable burden is the frustrating, fa frustrating fact that God does not seem to help him in this endeavor. This is the condition-centered Christian, like the one I spoke of, of uh, Phil. He is immersed in the defeat of Romans 7. He battles here below only to lose. He should rest above where he is sure to win. One of the chief reasons so many believers are spiritually ill as well as mentally and physically is a guilty, oppressed conscience. They are laboring under the burden of their unrighteous condition rather than resting in the liberty of their righteous position. Sad to say, there aren't many of God's people today who know anything at all about a pure, a perfect conscience. Countless Christians, including those who are awakened and hungry to grow, are bound by a bad conscience. They are honestly aware of their sinful condition but are only vaguely aware of their perfect position. This chapter has to do with the basic reason for the guilty conscience, which is the indwelling principle of sin. The next chapter will deal with the product of that principle, sins committed. First the cause, then the effect. There is a tremendous paradox in the Christian who, although redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ from the penalty and tyranny of sin, nevertheless is rendered spiritually helpless 
and useless by an overwhelming burden of guilt. Huge, huge. We are thinking of the hungry-hearted Christian who is awakened to the sin of self since he is the only one who is ready, prepared by the Holy Spirit, to be freed from his guilty condition. Awareness of need is the primary motivation for intelligent faith. Is this not the cry of the honest, struggling, guilt-ridden believer? I do not understand my own actions. I am baffled, bewildered. I do not practice or accomplish what I wish. But I do the very thing that I loathe, which my moral instinct condemns. However, it is no longer I who do the deed, but the sin principle which is at home in me and has possession of me. Romans 7, 15 and 17. This is from Miles J. Stanford, the complete works of Miles J. Stanford. So, who is the elephant and who is the writer? Do you have any ideas so far? Well, let's look. Here's a, some quotes from Jonathan Haidt to see if you can see now based on what we studied from the scriptural viewpoint of conscience, what you can see here with what Jonathan Haidt has said. The image that I came up with for myself as I marveled at my weakness was that I was a rider on the back of an elephant. I'm holding the reins in my hands and by pulling one way or another I can tell the elephant to turn, to stop, or to go. I can direct things but only when the elephant doesn't have desires of its own. When the elephant really wants to do something, I'm no match for him. When language evolved, the human brain was not re-engineered to hand the reins of power to the writer, conscious, conscious verbal thinking. Things were already working pretty well and linguistic ability spread to the extent that it helped the elephant do something important in a better way. The writer evolved to serve the elephant. The writer evolved, of course this is materialism, uh, evolutionary thought by Jonathan Haidt, not to be confused with the truth. Uh, but uh, this is what he says. When language evolved, the hum this was for the, for the processing of information. Uh, the brain was not re-engineered to hand the reins over to the power of the writer, the one in control, of course, supposedly in control. Things were already working well and linguistic ability spread to the extent that it helped the elephant do something important in a better way. <coughs> the writer evolved to serve the elephant. Well, do you see any conscience in the, in the writer? Any conscience? Trying to control the, the passions of the elephant and control the passions of what, do the, what the elephant, stop the elephant from doing what it wants to do, <coughs> but is harmless to do so, or is, is uh, powerless to do so. The automatic system was shaped by natural selection to trigger quick and reliable action and it includes parts of the brain that make us feel pleasure and, and pain, and that trigger survival-related motivations. The automatic system has its finger on the dopamine release button. <coughs> the control system, in contrast, is better seen as an advisor. It's a rider placed on the elephant's back to help the elephant make better choices. The writer can see farther into the future and the writer can learn valuable information by talking to other writers or by reading maps. But the writer cannot order the elephant around against its will. Any, any lights coming on anywhere? You give up? Here's another one. I believe the Scottish philosopher David Hume was closer to the truth than was Plato when he said, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. The what? <laughs> Here's another quote. In sum, the writer is an advisor or servant, not a king, president, or charioteer with a firm grip on the reins. The writer is Gazanaga's interpreter module. It is conscious, controlled thought. The elephant, in contrast, is everything else. The elephant includes the gut feelings, visceral reactions, emotions, and intuitions that comprise much of the automatic system. The elephant and the writer each have their own intelligence, and when they work together well, they enable the unique brilliance of human beings. 
A large part of it was strategy, the ways that children use their limited mental control to shift attention. This was the experiment, the kids that took the marshmallows. You get one or you get two. You get one if you want it now, you get two if you wait. Okay? In later studies, Michelle, Miss Michelle discovered that the successful children were those who looked away from the temptation or were able to think about other enjoyable activities. These thinking skills are an aspect of emotional intelligence, an ability to understand and regulate one's own feelings and desires. An emotionally intelligent person has a skilled writer who knows how to distract and coax the elephant without having to engage in a direct contest of wills. Another quote, mental intrusions. Edgar Allan Poe understood the divided mind. In The Imp of the Perverse, Poe's protagonist carries out the perfect murder, inherits a dead man's estate, and lives for years in healthy enjoyment of his ill-gotten gains. Whenever thoughts of the murder appear on the fringes of his consciousness, he murmurs to himself, I am safe. We make pronouncements, vows, and resolutions, and then are surprised by our own powerlessness to carry them out. We sometimes fall into the view that we are fighting with our unconscious, our id, or our animal self. But really, we are the whole thing. We are the rider, and we are the elephant. So what do you think? Yes? Is the elephant really like the sin nature and the reins, the conscience? And the reins, the, the rider? The reins, the conscience? The Okay, so we, uh, I want to use that one, let's use, so the elephant would be the, uh, the sinful nature, okay, whoa, that recognizes shapes, I don't want that one, <laughs> I don't know how to get rid of that shape, I guess, there's what I want, okay. All right, so the old sin nature for the elephant, okay. Well, what's the rider then? What's the rider? The old sin nature. <laughs> the sinful nature, okay. What's the rider trying to do? Control the elephant. Okay. Control the elephant. So, so uh huh. We make vows, promises, pronouncements, but we cannot keep them because the elephant can go wherever it wants to go. Okay. So, it's, what aspect of the old sin nature is the elephant? Human bad. Okay. What aspect of the rider? Of the whole sin nature is the writer. But what is Height's conclusion? We're both. When they work together, remember the very first quote from last hour in the uh, article about Height, that that the the success is when the elephant and the writer work together and they're happy. Right? You do both. You do human good, you do human bad. So, where would the conscience be? Where would the conscience be? Between the two, yeah, the reins or the goads as this really would be. The conscience <laughs> if I can get enough space there. The conscience is the battle between the good and the evil, and trying to control the two. Trying to control the evil. Remember, he said it's them working together in harmony. For the unbeliever, from the, for the atheist is, hey, whatever, as long as I can do enough good to feel good about myself and enough bad to have fun, we're happy. Okay? So conscience is between the two. The conscience is in between the two. Now, in Plato's uh, three, uh, the chariot and the driver and the two horses, then we can see the two horses, human good, human bad, the, the uh, 
chariot, the soul, and the driver, the conscience, or the soul, they, they call them the soul, the reasoning faculties of the mind. But see, they leave out conscience. Conscience is the one that passes judgment on which it is, human good or human bad. Which one's in control, the rider or the elephant, is where conscience is, where conscience resides. So his rider and elephant are nothing more than one part of the sinful nature and the other part of the sinful nature trying to balance them out and be a happy sinner. Okay? Be a happy sinner is what it all boils down to. Okay. Yes? Question? Nope. So, what would this picture look like if you had the coalescence of, of if you had uh, somebody walking by means of the Spirit? If you had somebody walking by means of the Spirit, oh, that's two or three or four lessons that's away. Yeah. We'll get there. You got you got a lot to learn before you get to Oh, this is uh, 9 and 10. We only got 11 and 12, huh? Okay. In our 12-part study. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, if, if this were, if, if he were a spiritual man, then this, the writer, would be the Holy Spirit, and the elephant would be the, uh, the uh, soul... And the, and the uh, flesh, or the sinful nature, all together. The Holy Spirit controlling everything that we do, if it's the spiritual walk. Okay. In the spiritual walk, the Holy Spirit controls all of our lower nature. Yeah. Not God is my co-pilot, God is my pilot. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, uh, this is uh, the old man. Okay, and this is the new man. So we are on top of the elephant insofar as we are walking in our reservoir of righteousness, in our spiritual nature. Yes, we would be, we would be the rider. Um, so you can change that uh, analogy based on what you're talking about. Yeah, but the Holy Spirit, as part of the new man, Riding the elephant, controlling the old man. You know, do not let the old man reign in your members. So, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, that would be the spiritual uh, application or the spiritual representation. Yes? Would the ghost still be the conscience, but then influenced by the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit controlling the conscience, yeah. Not influenced. If the, in the spiritual life, the Holy Spirit controls the conscience. And the only aspects of the conscience that he can't control is that which we have no doctrine. You know, because the Holy Spirit doesn't say, hey, you've never heard of this, but God says that you should do such and such, such and such is the right way. He only deals with what, because we have our responsibility. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit's job is to work with the knowledge that we have to control what we have. I mean, we could do another analogy and, and have the elephant be our, our spiritual life and the Holy Spirit controlling it. But there, and, and when we get off, go the wrong way, it's because we don't have doctrine, we don't have a background, we don't have a basis for knowing which route to take. So it doesn't matter what route you take. So the more you know, the more under control the Holy Spirit can be. You can, only, you can only give him control of what you know. And so if you don't know, then you're going off on your own. So if I don't know that, uh, that it's wrong to steal, we'll go back to that analogy. If I don't know that it's wrong to steal, which would be pretty hard you know, if knowing anything about the Bible, uh, but if I didn't know that it was wrong, according to the scriptures, to steal, then the Holy Spirit can't tell me it's wrong, not, uh, wrong to steal because he only deals with what we know. Okay? He, only knows, he only deals with the doctrine that we have. All right? So you could go off that way. Is the Holy Spirit any longer controlling your life? No, he's not. How do you get back into control? Well, when you confess a sin, you know some other sin, you confess that sin, which you'll do because you're now walking by means of the flesh, even, it's, even though it's 
by means of a fleshly thing that you're not aware of, you are walking in the flesh, so immediately you're going to commit another sin. You know, it's, not, it's oftentimes not the sin that you commit to get you out of fellowship that you confess. It's the next sin or some sin down the road that you, as the one that you confess to get back into fellowship. So you may confess, the, you, may, you may commit the same sin and get out of fellowship over and over and over again and never know it. Never know that that was a sin until later and you finally go, oh, there it is. Uh -huh. I didn't know that was wrong. Well, then now you, you commit that sin. You go, oh, I confess that. So you get back in fellowship sooner. And then you start to get, oh, wait a minute. What about resisting? Now I can recognize when, that's, uh, when that trap is baited, when there's bait in that trap and I'm being led along by my own proclivities here and I see that trap, I go, nope, not going there. I resist that temptation. Okay? And then you stay in the filling of the Spirit which is all part of the whole process that we're going to review and, uh, and build upon as we go into how we do this. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll go into our time of uh, prayer and supplication. Father, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for the study of human nature and the conscience and how the conscience fits uh, mostly in the unbeliever, but also in the believer and how we uh, are affected by our spiritual walk in our conscience. Uh, we'll look into that a lot more, and so we ask that you show us as we go forward in that how we can recognize, how we can build, how we can grow in that arena so that our conscience is in tune with your word by means of the Spirit's teaching and our doctrinal orientation so that we can hear the Spirit speak to us when he needs to. We thank you for our time together and ask that you bless it in Jesus' name.